extend a very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this weekend. And, um, you know, it's a really wonderful thing to uh, gather around the Lord's table. And I think this is something that as we do it on a monthly basis, uh, we really want to pursue the Lord uh, for a great, greater manifestation of what He intended his table to be. Amen. I think that we are working towards uh, probably next year that we will do the Lord's table a bit more often, not just once a month, and then um, uh, probably uh, once a fortnight. Because, you know, the, the, the communion table is really something that's central to the practice of our faith. Amen. So uh, we are working towards that. But let's just um, enjoy these moments where we may come to the Lord and uh, receive of His uh, goodness. Amen. Well, uh, one, again, this weekend, we want to launch quickly into um, the Word of God. And we, it's a real joy to have uh, uh, Jerry and Sue with us. And uh, I've known them for over 15 years. And it's uh, always been a joy to be with them in their, with their family in the States. And there's something that is so remarkable. Um, every time that I'm there with them, I'm constantly watching how Jerry treats his wife, Sue. And um, they've been married for 46 years, 43 years, okay? And just, you know, a few days ago, we took them on a river cruise. And we, a bunch of us were all around them. We were chattering away. We were making jokes. But the two of them were like uh, on honeymoon all over again, you know? They were holding each other. And I wish I had taken a photo to capture that moment. And it's as though after 43 years of marriage, honeymoon has not ended for them. And, you know, I've also uh, witnessed firsthand uh, their seven kids that they have and how they've raised their kids up, 14 grandchildren. And there is such a sense of um, honor. There is such, a, you know, a, a way in which they carry them that I just have the utmost respect for them and how they have raised uh, their families. And, of course, in many ways, uh, many of the um, thinking patterns I've had has been uh, deeply challenged uh, in my time spent with uh, Jerry and Sue, and I'm very, very grateful for that. And so this uh, weekend, it's a real joy to have Jerry and Sue with us. And if you just put your hands together, let's welcome uh, Pastor Jerry and Pastor Sue. Amen. Glory to God. What a thrill and a joy to be here. Hello, Life Church. It is so wonderful to see you, to be here, to share this moment with you this evening. I don't know if you realize what a beautiful place you live in, but this is one of our favorite places in the entire world because it's so neat and orderly and people are so friendly and everything's like brand new here. I mean, it's amazing. Maybe you've not been out into the rest of the world, but the rest of the world is like not this cool. Well, we are Swiss German background um, settlers that came across to Settlers, we are settlers. <laughs> Our forefathers, eight, we're both eighth generation um, who came and settled in the United <clears throat> States. And, you know, Swiss German people love things in order. So a, a community, a culture, a city like this makes us feel, oh, it's wonderful. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and um, Pastor Lip and Wendy, thank you so much for hosting us. David, we've had some fun with you and Mia and the team, Charmaine. Um, we're just, we love this team. You've got a great group of people here that love Jesus and want to see him manifested in the lives of every person each one of you touches and reaches. Amen, and congratulations for being part of this amazing church. Sue and I remember we actually met at a time when we met Jesus, and that resulted in us meeting each other. And that resulted in us uh, with some friends starting a church that was one of the defining things of our entire lives. And because of the fact that we fell in love with Jesus before we even met each other, uh, and to be honest, by that time, we were both so in love with the Lord that uh, we, we actually didn't fall in love with each other in the normal kind of way. It, this is kind of odd. I just remember looking across the room and uh, I was leading the group at the time, and, and people were coming to me, as they often do, to the leader, asking for life direction and what have you. And I, I looked over to the side, and I noticed that the girls were lining up talking to Sue. And I, I heard in my spirit the Lord say, this is your help meet. And I thought to myself, who talks like that? <laughs> have you ever, have, has, has anyone in this room ever even used that word? I haven't. And I said, wow, that's weird. And so I just began to uh, think about that. 
and uh, sort of moved in that direction, which actually led to us, our whole dating life was just doing Bible studies together. We sure did. <laughs> yes, we did. And believe it or not, I know you're going to find this very difficult to believe, but she was not attracted to me. I mean, how is that even possible? <laughs> so it took a long, in fact, can I, can I digress here and tell you an interesting side story because you may have had things happen in your life that you thought this isn't fair, this shouldn't have happened to me, this is wrong, I don't know how to deal with this, this is terrible, and everybody else has a good life but mine's in the toilet. Uh, and so that was kind of me because when I grew up, when I was like in 10th or 11th grade, I had really bad acne. You know, just it just looked terrible. There was nothing I could do. And, and I thought to myself, wow, you know, you don't usually see rich people with acne, so there's probably a cure and it's probably expensive. That's a good guess, isn't it? I, I actually was right. And so I discovered a dermatologist and I went there and uh, every couple of weeks this dermatologist would do things on my face and, and uh, it got better. So file that away in the history because it has nothing to do with the story until it appears later. But in any case, there was a nurse who used to work on me and for whatever reason, I have no idea where this came from, uh, but I've always had a desire to encourage people and to make their day, and I, I still do. I, I always try to cheer up the wait staff and the people who are cleaning your room because most people aren't naturally nice to them. And it's so easy and it costs nothing if you develop a habit. It just happens automatically in the background. So I used to always try to make this woman's day who was poking my face and making holes in it, uh, which was not comfortable for me, but I tried to cheer her up. So fast forward for many years. Uh, after Sue and I met, and uh, she really didn't like me. Do you want to tell them how much you didn't like me? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I was um, very closed to a future relationship. <clears throat> but Jerry was not the typical guy in our community. He had his own house that was a beautiful house. He drove a white Corvette, which was the most expensive sports car at that time in our area. Um, he dressed in designer clothing. He looked more like somebody from California. He did not look like the guys from our conservative Lancaster County, Pennsylvania Dutch area. So I was, I was like, this guy's great, but he's different. And I didn't see myself with him. So she finally had a plan on how to end our relationship that in her mind was going nowhere or at least she was pretty committed to it going nowhere. She decided to take me home to meet her nice conservative parents, and she was pretty sure that the moment they met me, that would be it, it would be over. So I rang the doorbell, and she says, well, hi, come on in. <laughs> I had no idea it was a trap. And she walked me into the living room, and there was her mom and dad. And her mom said, Jerry, it's you. I haven't seen you in like 10 years. It was the woman who worked on my face every day. So guess who liked him? Was open arms. I mean, she liked really me more than Sue did. Like, yeah, she did, and, and there was no resistance. I thought for sure they're gonna check out this guy. No way, you know, we don't want you going out with this guy. I was practically married that very night. <laughs> So the point of that story is, you know, sometimes really bad things, nasty things, uncomfortable, awkward things happen in our lives, and maybe, just maybe, that's going to turn out really well for you. Amen. Yeah. Everybody say amen. Amen. And All you know, right. sometimes we think our mm -hmm. life is going in a certain trajectory, and we think our future is going to look a certain way. And I think one of the keys in our lives is as we surrender to who Jesus is, his lordship, you know, he really does care about every single thing about your life. He does. He, he's so concerned about your life and your choices. Amen. And that in and of itself is just, you know, I, I just see the Lord cared about me and I was surrendered to him. I, that was the first time in my life I knew he wanted to be lord of my life. And I surrendered everything, and here's this Jerry, and the Lord orchestrates everything, and we actually were married a year later. So mm -hmm. talk about trajectory that was not my plan or purpose, but it was God's. Amen. Amen. <laughs> She's the best. I am so crazy in love with this girl, but we'll get to that later. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. If we can get that up on the screen. Yes for just a little while. I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith 
Then your lives will be an advertisement of his immense power as it works through you. That sounds like a pretty good life, doesn't it? How many of us would like to fit our lives into that verse? That's one of God's many promises for our lives. And no matter who you are or where you come from or what your background is, the Bible says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans for good and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Everybody say future and hope. And I like what Bill Johnson says about that verse. He says, you know, there's a lot of verses in the Bible that you read and you think, well, why is that even written there? And the reason that is written there is because a lot of days it's not going to seem like that. That's why we need to know the Word and align our lives with the Word so that we can become what the Bible promises our lives to become. Sue and I had such an encounter with the Lord when we were first married and, and still do like every day. In fact... Um, I'm a businessman. I'm not a pastor. I've never pastored a church in my life. Most people make that mistake. Oftentimes, I'll eat in a restaurant, and people will ask me, are you a pastor? And I said, no, not, not, a, not a pastor. Um, just because we love people, and we care about people. And so there came a time in our lives where our lives have been defined by numerous encounters with the Lord that completely, crazily just redefined our lives, like God would just show up and talk to us and change the course of our lives. And we thought, is there a way we can bring other people into this? So there was a time that Sue and I were away on a trip, and we both had these crazy supernatural encounters with God. And on the way home, she said to me, you know, why don't we have a meeting in our living room? And we can just invite some kids in and uh, have them encounter the Lord. And so we did that. And like 11 kids came, one of them got filled with the Holy Spirit, which seemed like nothing to us because that's just part of everyday life. But she brought her friends, and the next week there was 30, the next week there was 40, and we ended up having 70 kids in our living room every Thursday night for about, I don't know, seven years. And, and during that time, the Holy Spirit would show up and visit us, like, every Thursday night. We had pastors join us. We even had this guy who claimed to be from the First Church of Satan. I didn't know there was one, but he came, he came and stood like this with his hands against the wall and his eyes real big. And at the end, he said to me, I don't know who you people are or what just happened here, but I, I do know this is the most powerful spirit in the universe. And he walked out. We never saw him again. <laughs> but my point is this. People encountered God. And so we began to say to, to each other, how can, we, how can we take them to a place where their lives will be completely redefined? Now, Sue and I have done a lot of missions work, even though we've been business people all our lives, we just thought, let's go see what God will do. And so we go to various countries and meet with people and preach and teach in churches and government offices and all that kind of stuff. And so we began to, uh, we found some young people. This is a secret to life. Um, so if you're writing something down, when you find somebody that inspires you, get behind them and help them. And so we actually have spent our lives like just shopping for interesting people. And when we find interesting people, we make them part of our lives because we think that would be cooler than it is. And it is. So I found this young guy who was like the same age as one of our kids. And he talked about going into South America and doing crusades. And he said, uh, I, I said, have you ever done this before? He says, yeah, I did one. You should come along with me. So I said, okay. So even though I had seven of my own kids, I got on a plane and flew with him to, I think it was Guatemala. And it was a crazy time. So we began to take a lot of the kids who gathered in our living room on these trips. I would guess that we took somewhere between, I don't know, six or seven hundred and maybe a thousand kids, maybe two thousand. We never counted them. Um, but they came along with us on missions trips and we would teach them how to, um, I hate to say teach them how to pray for people because we really didn't because I don't like memorized prayers. That's ridiculous. I like prayers that come out of the heart, that, that go to the Father. And so what we would do is we would, uh, we would just tell them what to expect and we'd take them all on a plane. Uh, we actually took, at one time, we took 2,572 kids on one missions trip, and we hired our own 747. I didn't even know you could do that. It was a million bucks. That's a lot of money to spend in one week. Yeah. So we spent a million dollars, hired a 747 to make three round trips uh, from Philadelphia or wherever yeah, we went from, from Miami. Miami into Honduras. So anyway, we, we take these kids all over the world. We break them in it, up into street-sized teams of maybe uh, 15 or, or 20 kids. And then we do street dramas and sing songs and things just to gather a crowd. And then we give an invitation. We pray for people. 
And oh my goodness, let me tell you one story. Sue said, what story are you going to tell? I said, I have no idea. Um, Because we could talk for literally hours and hours and hours about all the incredible things that God did. So imagine this. We had, this was the smallest missions team we had ever taken because it was during a time when a hurricane came up the East Coast and closed all the airports. There was only one church who had planned to come with us who got out. And I didn't even know who they were. There was like 30 people, their youth leader who was about 40 years old and and uh, like 30 youth group kids and I purposely didn't even ask them the name of their church because if you know the name you might know what they believe and if you know the belief their beliefs you might want to poke at them and kind of you know say things that aren't helpful so I decided not to do that because that doesn't work out well so what we did instead this was so much fun this was crazy so as we were going out there there was a young do you know what Amish are You've heard of the Amish. So we live in the middle of Amish country. And there was a young Amish drug dealer. Yes, a lot of Amish are on drugs. And he was actually a drug dealer who came to our living room, got filled with the Holy Spirit, and started following us everywhere. And we were mentoring him to lead teams. So he was with us. And we're going on the bus to this first ministry site. And his name is Chester. And Chester said, Jerry, why don't you tell him about some of the miracles that you've seen different places? And so I, I told some stories. And they all looked at me like, yeah, you are so full of it. There is no way any of that could happen. And one of them, I think, even said that, perhaps the youth leader. (laughs) So I thought, well, this will be interesting. So we get into this place, which was a medical school. It was three stories high. It was surrounded with balconies the whole way around. We were in the courtyard doing our thing. And there was a couple thousand people up there. And uh, we we did the things that people usually do. And I, I knew that none of our team had ever experienced anything except Sue and I and Chester. And so Chester said, would you, do the, uh, would you do the net, which is what we called throwing out the invitation for people to give their lives to the Lord. And so I, uh, <laughs> so I did. I gave the invitation. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came over me. And uh, I, I heard myself say, even though you're here at a medical school, doubtless there are many of you who have been told by a doctor that you have a condition or disease that is going to take your life. But this is your lucky day. I have brought a team from the United States who are going to pray for you and you're going to be instantly healed. And I knew that none of them believed it. There wasn't a question in my mind. Not only that, they had just called me an idiot for saying such a thing. And suddenly, 300 people come and rush down to the front. And of course, our poor kids, who don't believe the thing, are looking for a door. But we're in a courtyard. There is no door. No no escape. Yes, thank you. It was in a Spanish-speaking country. It was in Peru. And so we had, of course, interpreters for all of them. And they prayed for all those people. Now, understand, they had no instruction. They had, there was nothing except, we don't believe you. That was the only instruction they had. You should have been on the bus ride on the way back. I have never heard such a thing in my life. Every one of them, everyone they prayed for had been completely healed. And the kids were saying, what are we going to do? What are we going to do with our lives? It's like the Bible is actually true. And we don't even know what to do with that because we spent our whole life in church where they said none of that stuff really counts today. Does this sound like fun to you? That was so much fun. Later that night, the youth pastor called his senior pastor... And he said the next morning, he said, I called the senior pastor and he said, this seems like God. I think you should go with it. (laughs) By the end of that week, because everywhere they went, miracles happened all over every site that we went to. And we had this group of, of translators who were from the largest church in Peru, literally a church of 80,000 people. And it was a spirit filled church. They had never seen anything like this. And understand, I'm just an observer. The only thing I did all week that I know that made any difference was say, come to the front and these people will pray for you when I knew that couldn't possibly happen. That's the only thing I did right all week. Any of you in this room could have made up such a silly thing, especially if you wanted to see a circus. (laughs) By the end of that week, all of the translators... And their friends said, we've never seen anything like this. Can you kids lay hands on us? We want the Holy Spirit that you have. And these kids who have never seen anything like this are laying hands on people and everybody's going out in the Spirit. And the kids have never seen that. That never happened in church. They didn't even know that's a thing. But they had encounters with God that redefined their lives. Yes. You know, it was so cool. We did a lot of ministry on plazas, street corners, or plazas. And, you know, we had 
young people that would lay hands on blind people and their eyes would open and they wouldn't even, they weren't even, they were so filled with emotion they couldn't even talk <clears throat> about it because some of them it was several, it wasn't just one blind person, it was one and then another and then another. Um, which was so precious. And we also had um, a man named Richard who was, he had a sign that gave him permission by the Peruvian government to beg. That he and, was actually legitimately crippled. Yeah, he was crippled. And he was hobbled over and he had his cane and everything else. And one of our team members was saying, you know, you, you just need to have faith, Richard. God wants to heal it you. It was Chester. You just need to have more <laughs> really faith. And, and here's poor Richard. He really wants to be healed, but what does it mean to have more faith? And he was raised in Catholicism, and just it was confusing. And Jerry kind of intervened and, and walked Chester through it, that it wasn't that he needed more faith. It was like a word of knowledge that Jerry had. Richard, is there someone you need to forgive? And he broke down and cried, and he needed to forgive his father, and he said also his brother, and he's just weeping, I, you know, forgiving the people that have hurt him. And then, boom, he gets healed. He no longer needs his crutches. He no longer needs his sign. He's totally healed. And then Jerry just leads him right into, this is Jesus who healed you, and he wants to be your Lord, your Savior. And he just was wide open. Yes, I want Jesus. So, you know, these are stories we're telling you to get you energized inside. You know, look at your hands. Mm -hmm. You see your hands. You know, Jesus said that the things that he did in John 14, 12, he said, the things that I have done, you're going to do as well and even greater. And I believe that that was not only in Amen. volume, but it was also insignificant things. You know, in Jesus' day, they didn't have things happening in the world like are happening now. Amen. And we're going to have to see, I believe, we're going to manifest, create, we're going to see God do creative miracles in people that in confusion change their bodies. That's, that's what's happening in the United States. And I, I believe, you know, we've, we've been hearing of, you know, metal in people's bodies from, from surgeries disappearing and, and there's being new cartilage and, you know, new bones. And we've seen a lot of creative miracles. We've seen tumors disappear and things like that. But it's not just for me or Jerry or the kids on the team. It's for everyone in this room wherever you go, whatever you do, to always be that vessel. And, and your hands are hands that are healing hands because Jesus paid the price on the cross for you and for every other person. And sometimes people, people get healed before they get born again. That's what is the gateway to lead them into the heart of the Father and into all they have, all he has for them. Yeah, you know, Jesus said, uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so look at your hands and yeah. say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. hand. The kingdom of heaven is at your hands. You have the ability to lay hands on anyone and just do what the Bible says. I know you're probably not going to go out of here and do that. I get that. But you could. It could happen today or tomorrow. And when I tell the kids on these mission trips, I always give them the same speech uh, because it, it just sets them free. Because most of them grew up in church where they heard that the... Uh, all the miracles went out with the last apostle, and that makes it easy for us because then we don't have to do anything that might not turn out too well for us. Uh, so I don't mention that to them. I just know that that's where they come from. And so usually what I say is, listen, I know that you all grew up in church, and you probably heard all of the church stories. You heard all the Bible stories. And I don't really even want you to ask yourself what you believe. I don't really care what you believe. I'm not asking you to believe anything. I'm asking you to act like the Bible's true for a week. And I know you know how to act because you have friends and you wouldn't if you weren't a good actor. You've gotten through school and I know how you act. You know how to act to the teacher. So I know you know how to act. So I'm just asking you to act for a week like the Bible is true. That's all. And see what happens. If nothing happens, no big deal. You don't ever have to come back here. These aren't your school friends. Nothing happened. If nothing happens, nothing happened. But what if it does happen? 
Well, there was this young girl who was about 17, and I know that she was having trouble at home with her parents who wasn't behaving very well and what have you. And so she came along, and uh, went, we went out to some place out in the street, and she found this woman who was blind. And she began to pray th- for her for, through the uh, interpreter that she could, uh, she, of course, asked the woman what she wanted to be prayed for, and the woman says, I want to see. And uh, so she prayed for her, and the woman's eyes opened, and she screamed. And she said through the translator, she said, three weeks ago, I was crying out to Jesus. This was in a Catholic country. I was crying out to Jesus, Lord, heal my eyes. And I saw in a vision a young girl come and lay hands on me and pray for me, and it was you. Now imagine what that did to that young girl. Today she's in a, in a local church, she's married, she has kids, she loves Jesus. That wasn't her condition before she experienced the power of God through her. And so what would happen to, what would happen to Singapore, what would happen to the world if Christians actually just acted like the Bible was true? Even if maybe we just acted like a little bit of it was true. So let's not bite off the whole thing. Just a couple verses maybe. What would happen if we acted like it was true? Wow. Well, I wasn't planning to tell that many stories, but you seem kind of interested. Um, No, but I feel like this is a word for you as you're a young church and you're, you're just getting started. But if you're a church that is known as a church that loves people and that is observant of the people around you, because each one of you has people you, only you can reach that I can't reach, that the person sitting next to you can't reach. You know, life is such an adventure with the Lord. Uh, um, If we're bored, it's because we're asleep. And I mean that. Um, Walking with Jesus is the most exciting adventure in life. It is. So... I'm, I'm excited for all of you just as, as a young church. Thank you, sweetheart. I, um, I want to talk a little bit, and my time's probably over already because I got here late. <laughs> <laughs> um, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Wow. Well, you may if you like, whatever, whatever you would like, my love. Um, You know, we live in a, in a season, a time, and a culture where everything is available to us. And the most common thing in the world for all of us is to take what we like about the Bible and we, what we like of what we know about Jesus and mix it with all the things that we like in our world. Because there's a lot of really nice, enjoyable things in the world. That never turns out well for any of us. Jesus says, I, I, I won't have any other gods before me. He won't have any gods beside him either. Uh, it's either Jesus is everything or he's nothing. And I remember that's why Sue and I got saved, because the guy who mentored us taught us that Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. So there's no, like, middle grounds. You don't get... Yeah, I mean, it's tough for us because we grow up when you, when you buy a car, you pick out what you want, you order the things you want, you go to a restaurant, you do the same thing. Everything in our lives is about designing our life the way we want it. And we kind of tend to design Jesus the way we want him. We think of him as, as kind of a, a Santa Claus where we can, he's the guy who controls everything, so we pray to him and nice things come to us and we get to live a happy, comfortable life. And, but God has a life that's so much better for us than that. But we have to be able to lay hold of it. I want to talk about something for, for just a few minutes. And that is and something that will be of significant interest to all of you. Um, you know, most of, us, most of us think that love is a mystery. It's not. Love makes all the sense in the world. It's, it's very obvious the way it works. I remember when God spoke to me about Sue, I began to see her in a way that attracted me to her. Whenever I'd look at her, I'd think about all the things that were attractive about her and the way she dealt with other people and how pretty she is and the way she carried herself and who she was in the spirit and what she loved about God. And if I ever saw anything about her that was unattractive, I would feel kind of sick in my stomach and I'd say, no, we can deal with that later. We're just, we're not dealing with that now. That's how love works. Okay, so most people put that away until they get married and they think, uh, we can deal with all those things. There were some yucky things. I'm sure we can deal with that later. And so after we get married, we explain to our spouse all the things that we didn't want to deal with while we were feeling that wonderful love feeling. Everybody with me? You getting this? Maybe this doesn't happen in Singapore. This is probably an American thing. I get it. I get it. But in any case, 
Uh, usually then when people get married, they bring out the list of things that need to change. Did you know that there's a couple of things that you do that are really annoying? And if you just tweak these few things, man, you would just be such a better person. And God has given us this relationship so that I can help you become the amazing person that you're called to be. And of course, as men, we know that they're going to say, oh my goodness, I had no idea. It's, I'm so thankful that you revealed this to me. I can't believe that I was so blind. How did I ever make it this far in life without your help? But you know, it never actually plays out that way. Some reason they take offense. Who would have guessed that? <laughs> but that's how most of us fall out of love. I'm telling you this because I want you, if you're married, to stay in passionate, crazy, out of your mind love for the rest of your life. And it's not that hard. It's absolutely as easy as what I just explained. So when I look at Sue, I don't allow my mind to think any thoughts that need to correct or reprove her because that's never actually worked. And it's not that I haven't tried. <laughs> so I have real proof that that's not going to work. But what I do is I look at her and I remind myself, oh my goodness, how is it possible I'm married to this gorgeous babe? No idea how that ever happened. For 43 years, we've been on our honeymoon. Sometimes when we go out in a restaurant, people will say, are you in your honeymoon? And we always say, well, of course. Look, that's my ring. Definitely on a honeymoon. We've been on our honeymoon for 43 years and it gets richer and deeper and deeper all the time. Now, I brought this out because that is a real opportunity for anyone in this room, whether you're married or not married, to understand how love works, you can fall in love for the rest of your life. You know, I often wondered why God designed love and the whole relationship thing the way he did, uh, because it seems like it has destroyed many people's lives because of not understanding it. And I remember... I remember when we got married and I, I looked at this beautiful woman and I thought, my goodness, she's just incredible. How am I ever going to be the man of God that she needs? And it just so happened that we got married around the time that the three most famous ministers in the United States fell to sexual sin. And I thought, my goodness, if they can't behave, and these are like the most powerful spiritual men that I ever saw on TV. How is it possible that I could behave? You know, what's the chances that I'm not going to destroy her life and the life of my kids? And I didn't think it was possible. And then I read the Bible, and I discovered that the strongest guy who ever lived fell because of a woman. The most spiritual man after God's own heart, David, not this David, a different David, uh, fell because... He couldn't control his thoughts and his behavior. But surely wisdom would mean that would never happen. Of course, you know where I'm going. Samson destroyed the whole kingdom because he couldn't control himself. Solomon, Solomon. thank you. Thank you. Wow, it's good to have a guy in the front row here. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says, Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Since we live in a relatively safe culture where they don't hate Christians, it's easy for us to still think we can choose what we like about the kingdom and about the gospel, and we can, don't have to deal with the things that we don't like. We don't have to behave a certain way if it's not popular. We can just enjoy all the good things the world has to offer, and it'll all work out well for us. No, it doesn't work out well. That's why men of God still fall all the time, every day, all around the world, in every possible culture. And it's not just falling to sexual sin, it's falling to all the entrapments that the world has. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6 says, By the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. No one ever has an affair if they're walking in the fear of the Lord. Last year, I was sitting with a guy on my back porch, a very famous, world-famous man of God who said, you know, my whole life I have struggled with pornography. I said, wow, that must be terrible. He said, don't you? I said, no. He said, well, how, how is it possible you don't struggle with pornography? I said, oh my goodness, when we got married, the three most spiritual men that I knew fell to sexual sin. And then I told him the Bible stories. And I said, if those guys can't survive, what hope is there for me? I can't move an inch in that direction and think that I'm not killing everyone who matters to me. How could I give that an inch? I'm sharing this because as believers, we live in this crazy 
this crazy, mushy, gray cloud that we kind of call grace. I have a, an amazing non-Christian Jewish rabbi friend. They have no understanding of grace. For them, the law is the law, and you do it. For us as believers, we just think, well, I can kind of kind of, sort of try to obey what the Bible says, and if it doesn't work out, I'm sure the Lord will forgive me. You know, because that's how we live, because we have this phony ex- understanding of what grace is. But the Bible tells us what grace is in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 to 3. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Say, granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. So that's what grace is. Grace gives us the power to live a godly life. It's not the getaway free ticket when we sin. That's not what grace is. It's been turned upside down. In reality, grace is the power to live a godly life so that we can be the children of God that God promised us that we could be. I want to leave you with this thought. There is good news, but you can't make up your own gospel. You can't sort of say, well, I'm I'm sort of half trying and I'm sure it'll work out because the Lord will forgive me. He does forgive you. But if you jump off the top of a building and fall to the ground and cry out to him for forgiveness, he will forgive you, but there is still the other end. Grace doesn't change the outcome of the choices that we have made. But there is good news. Jesus said in John chapter 1, verse 12, to as many as received him, he gave the power to become sons of God. Sons of God isn't just a a club. It's not just a sort of go to church kind of person. It means we get to live like God said children of God would live. That's a promise. We receive Jesus. We receive his grace. His grace is the ability not to sin. And we walk in the power of God, demonstrating the purposes of God everywhere we go and everything we do in life. I want to leave you with this one thought. And that is, I often, I I usually try to bring out every time I speak, um, what the purpose of the whole universe is. Because if you don't understand the purpose of reality, how can we make decisions about anything? I mean, none of us would, would go and just randomly start buying stocks without understanding the financial systems and how stock trading works. I hope not anyway. And yet we live without trying to even understand what is the universe about? Why did God create all of this? And it's really very simple. God created everything we know for one purpose and one purpose alone. And that is he wanted to have sons and daughters. And in order to have sons and daughters, he had to create people who had a free will. In other words, the ability to choose that they weren't going to be sons and daughters. So this entire universe, the planets, especially this one we live in, I'm not sure if there's life on other planets or not, not relevant. But everything that's on this planet is nothing but a place for you and I to live out our lives to choose whether we're going to follow the desires of the flesh or whether we're going to choose to become like God. And I don't mean that in some weird, funky, far out there thing. I mean whether we're going to choose to bend our will, to let Jesus bend and shape our will into the purposes and nature of God so that we can become the people he wants to spend eternity with. That's what we do with our entire lifetime. We either become the people he wants to be with forever, or we're not. Is that okay? Does that make sense? The Bible says when the Lord comes back in 2 Peter 310, I think it is, that when he returns, he's going to come with a shout, and the earth, its works, and the entire universe will be destroyed with a fire. So none of this means anything to him. This is everything that we worship, (laughs) everything that we think is important, everything that we think is matters, means nothing to God. You are the only thing that matters to God. All of these things were created for you to decide to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
and this is your day. If there's anyone here who doesn't know Jesus, but you'd like to become a son of God, I invite you to come to the front right now. Anyone in this room, please. I realize most people in this room are already walking with God, but I wanted to give you that opportunity. Pastor? Why don't we all just stand to our feet and, and uh, let's just look to the Lord. And again, you know, th there is such a sense of clarity um, this evening. And, uh, and maybe most of us here are Christians. Most of us here have a relationship with the Lord. We've at some point given our lives to the Lord. Right? But if there happens to be someone who is here, and you've never taken the step to surrender your life to the Lord. You know, and, and sometimes, you know, um, just the other day, somebody was saying to me this, hey, actually, if you look carefully in the Bible, there's like, um, you know, we, we say the sinner's prayer, right, to receive Christ into our hearts. And it's like in the Bible, actually, there is no sinner's prayer, right? People, at some point, the Lord calls them, and they decided to follow Him. And they gave their lives wholly to follow Him. They gave up their careers. They gave up their professions. They gave up everything and they followed the Lord. Amen. And I, I just feel this, more, this evening the invitation that um, the Lord is leading us to have is not just to come up and say a simple prayer and then you become a Christian. Right? I really feel like there's a real challenge for us. You know, that you've, you've never surrendered your life to the Lord. And you said, Lord, I want to give my life. I believe. I want to follow you. I want to make you the Lord mm -hmm. in my life. Right? If, if that's never happened to you before, if you've never done that. And, you know, we don't have to get weird about this. We don't have to, like, you know, create an ideal atmosphere for this to happen. Hey, we make these decisions to follow the Lord. Right? Mm -hmm. When I gave my life to the Lord at the age of 12 years old, it was in a little classroom. And there were three boys. Uh, uh, in, there were three boys apart from me, so four of us. And there was a teacher who gave an invita invitation, and I gave my life to the Lord. I walked out of that classroom, and everything changed. Everything in my life changed, and I knew that something had happened. I knew I was born again. I knew that something had happened in me. Right. So if that's never happened for you before, if you've never surrendered your life to the Lord before. I just want to ask you, you know, it doesn't matter if anyone is looking around, just get out of the seats, come right up to the front here, and we want to pray with you. We want to pray with you, okay? Is there anyone at all? You just come up, and we are going to pray for you, okay? Yeah, just come up if you want to. Is there another? I want to also, I just feel also, you know, when um, uh, Jerry and Sue were speaking earlier, you know, about that sense of being used by God. Right? And I, I just feel, as they were saying that, that hey, we must not miss an opportunity for an impartation. Amen? And, and, and you know, um, and I, I love it that when, um, when something like that happens and we hear from the Lord that we can receive an impartation and God wants to use us. I know this. I know that God wants to use every one of us. Last, uh, last Saturday, Pastor Nikki prayed for Pastor Elijah and gave him a word about evangelism. And you know, Pastor Elijah used to always give these testimonies about how he would take grab and he'll be sharing uh, Christ with people. And since church started, we've been all been very busy and he hasn't quite been doing that. And Pastor Nikki gave him a word, said that, hey, this is going to happen again in your life. Within a couple of weeks, you're going to see that activated. And then yesterday, he took a grab. And when he stepped into the grab, the person who drove the grab is his old uh, friend from army. And then he, he talked to the guy, gave him words of knowledge, and then the guy was just shocked, prayed for the guy, and the guy said, you know, um, he's going to come to church, right? And so these things happen. God works. God really works. Okay, so again, if you have never surrendered your life to the Lord, I really want to ask you to come, and you come to my left side, and I will be here on the left side, and I'll pray for you, okay? But if you want an impartation, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask Jerry and Sue and Elijah and our prayer teams to come and lay hands and pray for you guys. And you want to be empowered to 
heal the sick, to cast out demons, to do the things, the works of God, right? And I want to also give you the opportunity to do that, okay? And we're going we're gonna to do a quick... Um, um, how should we do it? Do you want to do the announcement first? There's quite a lot of announcements. Okay, why don't we just pray? Uh, you guys, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to come up and we're going to pray for you. And while we're praying for the people, we'll just quickly do the announcements. And those of you who need to go off, you can go off, okay? And again, we don't want to get funky about this. We don't have to play atmosphere. We're just going to do it. So if you want an impartation, come up right now and we're going to pray for you, okay? And the prayer teams are going to come and pray for you. Just come, just come. And if you want to surrender your life to the Lord, come to the left side. And, uh, you know, and I will pray for you on this side. So come, those of you who want an impartation from the Lord to be used by God in signs and wonders, healing, come forward, okay? You know, how, how wonderful it is to, to show the love of God when God heals the sick, when God uses you to touch them in a physical need that they have, okay? So if you want to be used by the Lord and you want an impartation, come here to the right. And for the rest of us, just remain standing and we're just going to honour this moment as we pray for people, but we're also going to give a few announcements.